Hello everyone, welcome to worship. We're here at Trinity Lutheran Church in Litchfield Park, Arizona, and we are glad that you're with us today. Our summer series, we've been taking a look at themes from the Gospel of John. Today we're gonna to take a look at a well-known miracle, probably um, you're familiar with the story of the wedding at Cana, where Jesus turns the water into wine. It's a fascinating story. There's a lot of things going on in this story. Um, one of the things that we want to think about today, though, is why did John choose this miracle to begin his introduction to Jesus? Why was that miracle at Cana so important? And we're going to see that Jesus is signaling to us and to the world that he is here, that he is the Messiah and the Savior of the world so that we put our faith in him and we have eternal life. We're glad you're with us today as we gather around the word of God to, um, to worship, to study, to grow in faith as we take a look at John chapter two and the miracle at Cana. We're glad you're with us. Today we're gonna worship in our Family Life Center. We'll see you there in just a minute. All glory to our Lord and God For love so deep, so high, so broad The Trinity whom we adore Forever and Welcome to worship today. We gather in worship in the name of the Father, and of the Son, and of the Holy Spirit. Amen. Lord, have mercy on us. Christ, have mercy on us. Lord, have mercy on us. Show us, O Lord, your mercy, and grant us your salvation in Jesus Christ our Lord. Amen. We pray Luther's morning prayer. I thank you, my Heavenly Father, through Jesus Christ, your dear Son, that you have kept me this night from all harm and danger. And I pray that you would keep me this day also from sin and every evil, that all my doings in life may please you. For into your hands I commend myself, my body and soul and all things. Let your holy angel be with me, that the wicked foe may have no power over me. Amen. Today we turn to God's holy word and we look first to the Old Testament, the book of Amos, chapter 9, beginning at the 11th verse. In that day, I will raise up the booth of David that is fallen and repair its breaches and raise up its ruins and rebuild it as in the days of old. 
and they may possess the remnant of Eden and all the nations who are called by my name, declares the Lord who does this. Behold, the days are coming, declares the Lord, when the plowman shall overtake the reaper and the treader of grapes, him who sows the seed. The mountains shall drip sweet wine and all the hills shall flow with it. And I will restore the fortunes of my people Israel and they shall rebuild the ruined cities and inhabit them. They shall plant vineyards and drink their wine and they shall make their gardens and eat their fruit. I will plant them on their land and they shall never again be uprooted out of the land that I have given to them, says the Lord our God. Our second reading is from the book of Revelation, chapter 19, beginning at the sixth verse. Then I heard what seemed like the voice of a great multitude, like the roar of many waters, like the sound of the mighty peals of thunder, crying out, Alleluia! For the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exult and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. It was granted to her to clothe herself with fine linen, bright and pure. For the fine linen is the righteous deeds of the saints. And the angel said to me, Write this. Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage supper of the Lamb. And he said to me, These are the true words of God. And our gospel lesson today is the story of the wedding at Cana in John chapter 2, the first 11 verses. On the third day, there was a wedding at Cana in Galilee, and the mother of Jesus was there. Jesus also was invited to the wedding with his disciples. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, They have no wine. And Jesus said to her, Woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. His mother said to the servants, Do whatever he tells you. Now there were six stone water jars there for the Jewish rites of purification, each holding 20 or 30 gallons. Jesus said to the servants, Fill the jars with water. And they filled them up to the brim. And he said to them, now draw out some and take it to the master of the feast. And so they took it. When the master of the feast tasted the water now become wine and did not know where it came from, though the servants who had drawn the water knew, the master of the feast called the bridegroom and said to him, everyone serves the good wine first. And when the people have drunk freely, then the poor wine. But you have kept the good wine until now. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory, and his disciples believed in him. This is the word of our God. We continue now by confessing our faith in the words of the Apostles' Creed. I believe in God the Father Almighty, maker of heaven and earth and in Jesus Christ, his only Son, our Lord, who was conceived by the Holy Spirit, born of the Virgin Mary, suffered under Pontius Pilate, was crucified, died, and was buried. He descended into hell. The third day he rose again from the dead. He ascended into heaven and sits at the right hand of God the Father Almighty. From thence he will come to judge the living and the dead. And I believe in the Holy Spirit, the holy Christian church, the communion of saints, the forgiveness of sins, the resurrection of the body, and the life everlasting. Amen. Your grace changed my life, your grace set me free, 
your grace pave the road so I can live eternally the best of all the blessings I've received is your grace your grace your grace if I could take the many gifts you've offered me Pile them all together, I know I would see. The greatest gift is love that I'm not worthy of. Not worthy but still, you give to me abundantly, and your grace changed my life. Your grace set me free. Your grace. Pave the road so I can live eternally. The best of all the blessings I've received is your grace. Your grace. Your grace. There was a time when my life made no sense to me. Used and all alone, I wandered aimlessly. Sin showed me I was lost, but you showed me the cross, where Jesus paid the price to rescue me. And your grace changed my life. Your grace set me free. Your grace. Pave the road so I can live eternally. The best of all the blessings I've received is your grace. Your grace. Your grace. Your grace changed my life. Your grace set me free. Your grace. Pave the road so I can live eternally. The best of all the blessings I've received is your grace. Your grace. Your grace. The best of all the blessings I've received is your grace. Can you imagine seeing Jesus work a miracle? Wouldn't that be something? That must have been how the disciples felt at the wedding at Cana. They had just started following Jesus. They were trying to get to know him. They were starting to learn his teachings. They were starting to have faith in him as the Messiah. And now they're in a remote village, Cana. They're at a, at, a, at, a, at a wedding in a small town. And unbeknownst to the other guests, and out of the blue, Jesus works a mighty miracle right before their eyes. Jesus commands creation with his word. He speaks, and water is turned into wine. A lot of water is turned into a lot of wine. In the Gospel of John, this is the first of Jesus' miracles. However, John doesn't call them miracles. He calls them signs. The miracles are signs because they point to Jesus and his word. Jesus' powerful miracles are signs that really show that he is God the creator 
who has come into the world as a man. God in flesh. God incarnate. The miracles show us that Jesus is the Messiah, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life in his name. The miracles not only teach us who Jesus is, but they also are signs to authenticate his word and his teachings. The idea is that if Jesus can do these great and powerful works, then his words are trustworthy and true also. You can trust Jesus. You can believe his words. The miracles are signs that show us that he is God on earth and that his word is trustworthy and true. By writing his gospel, John has given us a front row seat to see for ourselves the miracles of Jesus and to hear for ourselves his teachings. Like the disciples that were there at Cana that day, we too put our faith in Jesus. We know that he is God on earth and that his word is trustworthy and true. His word teaches us that he is the Christ. He is the son of God. He is the savior of the world. You can trust Jesus. You can put your faith in his word. You know, one of the interesting things to think about with this miracle at Cana is why did Jesus even choose to do this miracle in the first place? Why did he choose to turn water into wine at a wedding? Why did he choose to, to work a miracle in a private setting in a remote village? You know, I bet the bride and the groom could have probably used a new house or maybe even a bag of gold or a beautiful vineyard or a new olive grove. Why did Jesus choose to turn water into wine at a wedding in Cana as his first sign, his first miracle? It's because it was prophesied in the Old Testament. Not exactly the miracle at Cana, but the Messianic age would be a time of overflowing wine. Jesus is signaling the beginning of his ministry. He is signaling that salvation is here, that he is the Messiah doing the work on our behalf to rescue us. The Messianic age has begun. The Old Testament is, is like the water that's in the jars at that wedding. That plain water can't bring joy to people. The Old Testament is like that. It can't bring joy to people by forgiving their sins or giving us eternal life. There is no purification, no cleansing of our conscience in the Old Testament sacrifices or rituals. There is no forgiveness and no cleansing of our consciences in anything that we ourselves can do or our good efforts. Everything in the Old Testament pointed forward to Jesus. He is the only one who can save us. He is the only one who can cleanse our consciences. And at the wedding at Cana, Jesus is signaling that he's here. The Messiah is here. Jesus is the long-awaited, promised one of the Old Testament. And he will forgive our sins. And he will cleanse our consciences. In the prophecies, the Messiah will bring new wine in abundance 
and there will be great joy for God's people. Jesus brings that great joy by forgiving sins, cleansing consciences, and giving eternal life. Jesus has forgiven you your sins. He has cleansed your conscience, and he has given you the gift of eternal life. In faith, we rejoice. We are filled with joy. Jesus' first sign signals that the Messianic age has begun. The New Testament is beginning. Jesus is doing the work of salvation on our behalf. He will bring forgiveness of sins and cleanse our consciences and give us eternal life as a free gift. It's all about Jesus and his work of salvation for us. At the wedding at Cana, not only the miracle, but also Jesus' words point us forward to the work that he will do to forgive our sins, cleanse our consciences, and give us eternal life. He calls his work that he does, and especially his death and resurrection, Jesus refers to that as his hour. In the story, remember Mary told him that, alerted him to the crisis, that they were out of wine. And here's what it says in John chapter 2. When the wine ran out, the mother of Jesus said to him, they have no wine. And Jesus said to her, woman, what does this have to do with me? My hour has not yet come. Jesus uses this phrase, my hour, seven times in the Gospel of John. And it refers to his death and resurrection. When Jesus dies on the cross, then his hour has come and his work will be complete. The phrase points Mary and us to the cross, to the work the Savior is doing for us. We all know that Jesus did not come into this world to supply wine at a wedding at Cana. Rather, he came into the world to give his life for the sins of the world. Jesus' hour will come when he suffers and dies on a cross to set us free from sin, from guilt, from death itself. Jesus is not just a miracle worker. He is the savior of the world. He is moving to a specific hour, a time where he will suffer and die for all of us. You know, the story at the wedding at Cana ends with that key point being highlighted. The disciples put their faith in him. Here's how John wraps up the story in verse 11. This, the first of his signs, Jesus did at Cana in Galilee and manifested his glory. And his disciples believed in him. That's why this story of the wedding at Cana was written down in scriptures. So that you too will put your faith in Jesus. Like the disciples, you, you see the miracle and, and you hear his words. Believe that Jesus is the Messiah, the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life in his name, life that will never end. You see, that believing is so important because that's your connection to the Savior. Faith is, is how you receive the blessings of God. Faith is, is a work of God that comes through his powerful word. The Holy Spirit brings you the story of Jesus his death and his resurrection, his work of salvation for you. 
and you know that it's true and that you are included, that your sins are forgiven. You learn to know that Jesus is the Savior of the world and that he has saved you as well. You know him personally as your Savior. This story at the wedding at Cana is written so that you will believe that Jesus is the Christ, the Son of God, and that by believing in him, you will have life in his name. Through faith in Christ, by believing his works and his word, you are invited to yet another wedding feast, not in Cana in Galilee, but in God's heavenly kingdom. You see, at Cana that day, there were two grooms. Jesus, the Messiah, is also a groom. He is the groom of his bride, the Holy Christian Church. Salvation is pictured as a marriage between Christ and his people. That means that that Christ loves you, and he gave himself up for you. He has washed you and sanctified you and cleansed you. You are holy and without, ble uh, without blemish. The holy Christian church is the bride of Christ. And Christ, as our groom, he keeps his promises to you. He is the perfect husband. He remains faithful to you throughout your life. He is committed to you and your well-being. He promises you to use all of his resources on your behalf. He's going to use his mighty power to watch over you and make all things work for your good. That's his promise to you. And we know that he is faithful, that he is true, and that we can trust him. He has given you his name in holy baptism. You belong to his family. You eat at his table as he gives you his body and blood and bread and wine for the forgiveness of your sins, to cleanse you of um, guilt, to give you the gift of eternal life. Christ is the groom. The holy Christian church is his bride. That includes you. It's a way to describe God's unending love for you. Through faith in Christ, you are united with the Savior for eternity. You are invited to the wedding feast of the Lamb in the kingdom of heaven. One of the ways that heaven is described as this, is as this wedding feast. Here's a couple examples. We heard today from Revelation chapter 19. Alleluia, for the Lord our God, the Almighty reigns. Let us rejoice and exalt and give him glory. For the marriage of the Lamb has come, and his bride has made herself ready. Later in Revelation 19, it says, Blessed are those who are invited to the marriage feast of the Lamb. And in Ephesians chapter 5, it teaches us, Husbands, love your wives as Christ loved the church and gave himself up for her, that he might sanctify her, having cleansed her by the washing of water with the word, so that he might present to the church to himself in splendor, without spot or wrinkle or any such thing, that she might be holy and without blemish. Christ is the groom. The holy Christian church is his bride. It's a way that the Bible uses for us to think about salvation. It's a way for you to know and believe the Savior's unending, faithful, committed love to you. You are invited through faith in the Lord Jesus Christ to the wedding feast of the Lamb in the kingdom of heaven. 
So this wedding at Cana, it's Jesus' first miracle. It's how John introduces us to Jesus in his gospel. And this miracle, it was quiet. It was private. Only a handful of people even knew what was going on. But his disciples did. His disciples saw it, and they put their faith in Jesus. Today, through the eyes of faith, may you see it also. And may you hear the words of Holy Scripture. May you see the miracle and believe the Savior. Amen. We pray. God the Father, we thank you for revealing your Son to us in Holy Scripture. Help us to be like the disciples who see Jesus' miracles and hear his teachings and put their faith in him. Grant us strong faith throughout our life and keep us close to your Son by the power of your Holy Spirit. We pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. We join together in the Lord's Prayer. Our Father, who art in heaven, hallowed be thy name. Thy kingdom come, thy will be done, on earth as it is in heaven. Give us this day our daily bread, and forgive us our trespasses, as we forgive those who trespass against us. And lead us not into temptation, but deliver us from evil. For thine is the kingdom, and the power and the glory forever and ever. Amen. And now may the Lord bless you and keep you. May the Lord make his face to shine upon you and be gracious unto you. May the Lord look upon you with favor and give you peace. Amen. God's blessings to you. May you have a great week. We'll see you next week in worship. Oh, God.